people reading Philip K. Dick. Here are five tips for you. Uh, a few years ago, I posted a video on my first experience reading through Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? I had always been an appreciator of the cinematic translations of Philip K. Dick, like uh, Blade Runner or Total Recall, and there was always something about those translations that um, that spoke to me in some kind of deep way, and I think that's why we keep revisiting them, uh, those universes in the cinematic scape, uh, whether we're talking about um, the new Blade Runner 2049 by Villeneuve or uh, the Total Recall remake, which wasn't that good, or even uh, uh, Electric Dreams on Amazon, which I really did enjoy, although it really did take quite a few liberties with uh, the original stories. Uh, regardless, we, we keep coming back to Philip K. Dick. There's something about his writing and his world building, his universes, that uh, are speaking some kind of truth to uh, the contemporary experience of being in the modern world. Um, that they, They're saying something about our cultural conditions, our, our sort of cultural phenomenology, as I like to call it. Um, so I encourage you to take these five tips and go ahead and pick up a PKD book uh, when you're done listening here. So the first one is Reality Vertigo. Uh, PKD is great in his narrative style because he's able to take a character, take a world, take a story, and then flip it upside down and then do it again, and then maybe even do it again before the book ends. He's able to really subvert not only the identity of the character, uh, the, but also the world that the character is in is not always what it seems, and the characters themselves are not always who they seem. So there's this constant deconstruction and reconstruction of the narrative, the character, and the world that's always happening in PKD novels. Uh, Richard Doyle, who I did a class with um, earlier uh, last year, he describes... Uh, PKD novels is sort of a, um, a, a story, a hero's journey without a spine, right? It's a book without a spine. He's, he's describing his um, exegesis book, which is sort of a, it's a nonfiction journal towards the end of his life that was published, I think, in 2012 or 2011. Really interesting stuff there. We're going to get into that in a moment. But um, essentially, uh, there is a deconstructive element throughout of all, all of PKD's writings, um, it can be a little destabilizing for the reader experience, the narrative experience of the reader who's going through this. It can feel a little dizzying, and so that's why I wrote this in my notes as reality vertigo. Everything's kind of spinning around, and very often you have to take pause with the characters. And, and again, here's the sympathetic quality to PKD's writing. You really get in to the minds and the hearts of the characters. You really sympathize with their plight. And you really kind of feel an efficacy with the writing style, which can make you begin to feel a little dizzy and question your own reality in a sort of subtle way. Um, there's a kind of a bleeding into the real world effect that his writing has uh, for a lot of readers. And I think that's why they enjoy him so much, how, how powerful and potent his, his writing style and his writing style is and his narrative style is. So um, that alone is something to look out for, and you'll notice it right away. Um, everything from Ubik to Do Androids Dream to even Vallis in, in the later novels. Um, another thing, so number two would be the ersatz slash fake versus real. Um, so very often PKD's novels, they deal with a world that has been intentionally fabricated or faked, or um, it is somehow, there, there, there's a there's some kind of staging effect that's always going on uh, or a question of whether or not something is real or fake this is a very this is something he entertains on many different levels not only a kind of a cosmological level which we're going to get into but also the minute details in, D in do androids dream for instance uh the the whole novel is based around um, theological questions which was not translated into the movie uh, ecological questions but also economic ones. Everybody loves these, um, well, in this scenario, animals are, for the, e ecosystems are, for the most part, destroyed. Um, so there is a value in something being real. If you have a real dog, and not just a, an android dog, then your economic and social status is quite high. So there's this, always this question, is this real or is this fake? And it's going down from the minute, like I said, and sort of the economics of the world to the big questions of the world, like um, Mercerism, the religion in Durandre's dream. Uh, was this just a fake religion, this designed, as sort of this um, 
mediated experience that everybody plugs into or is there a reality behind it because Deckard has a vision of Mercer and he has that frog experience towards the end of the novel where he's trying to um, discern whether or not this was a kind of a, a religious experience so there's a there's a balancing between the fake and the real a questioning a constant inquiry and he's turning it over uh, all the time it becomes fake from one angle and then it becomes real from another so there's this ambiguity between the fake and the real that's always happening ersatz worlds and uh, we're going to get into a little bit of the gnostic elements too which are definitely also present in this um a lot of the villains in pkd's novels like uh the protagonist in uh in ubik is dealing with a villain um who is sort of constructing and generating a world around him and i don't want to get into too many details but there's a gnostic um, and gnosticism is called the de demiurge or demurge and it's basically this sort of fake creator god who creates a sort of a, a holodeck for everybody and keeps them trapped in there and is sort of a kind of a, a petty god who wants to be this grand creator but they're really not so the fakeness of the world starts to sort of bleed in and bleed through and so on um, and I already mentioned Mercerism and Android's dream. So the fake versus the real, the ersatz, that's number two. Uh, number three, and this one is also really important, it's the, the, the winding down of the universe. Um, something PKD calls entropy, um, cosmic entropy. It's present in so many of his novels. I'm just going to keep going back to Do Android's dream and Ubik because um, they're a little earlier, and Ubik especially um, was earlier before he had his later novels and which they it kind of change in their narrative design a little bit they're a little bit less pulpy and and, and page turny um and a little bit more reflective and dialogue oriented and um some people don't like that some people do so keep that in mind as well but um nevertheless all of his novels are concerned with this question which is a cosmological question and and also a theological one, but cosmological in the sense that the universe is winding down. Um, there's a kind of a, 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 a fascination and a concern with how things decay, things wind down, things break down, civilizations break down, time wears things down. He's concerned about the, the heat death of the universe. Um, and so on. So a lot of his novels explore this cosmic entropy and the problem of cosmic entropy. And there's this a kind of um, a tragedy in it, right? So his characters, despite the fact that he's always deconstructing them in their worlds, as I said, there's a sympathy you have with them. And they remain heroes in the sense that even though they're not perfect, uh, PKD is always framing this as an empathy question, a question of, of, um, having empathy for the creature that is born into a world that winds down a creature that is born to die right um a universe that isn't perfect a universe full of suffering a universe full of kind of um no cosmic decay you know it's a very kind of buddhist oriented question but it's also a christian oriented question right so christianity pops in quite a bit in his novels as well with mercer for instance is this um this this uh deific figure who takes on the suffering of the world and is trying to fix it and trying to um right the world and and there's a sense that the world that has been created and this goes back to the fakeness of the world and the sort of the gnostic elements of pkd the worlds in pkd's novels are somehow um, um were, were intended to be created better than they were there's a kind of a mistranslation. There's a kind of a, something went wrong. And so beings die and suffer and the universe winds down. And so there's this desire to right what went wrong. And there's an empathy for the sentient beings that are in these universes that, that have to deal with these cosmic conditions, these existential conditions of life winding down and decay and death and so on. Um, so that's throughout many of his novels, like I already mentioned. Uh, PKD's uh, Android's Dream, Ubik, the Valis trilogies, uh, trilogy, um, the Exegesis itself. Uh, so that's number two, then three is Entropy, and then four, um, this is where it gets reversed a little bit, right? So this cosmic entropy, this heat death, um, PKD calls it in, in a Android's Dream, a uh, kibbleization. The whole world is falling into kibble, a kind of um, abandoned 
that a good vision of it is actually not just the novel but Blade Runner the original the falling apart apartment building uh, many stories high at the end of the film where everything is kind of rotting away and um, uh, there's rain pouring in and the bathrooms are falling apart right and there's these puddles everywhere and and the walls are falling down this is sort of the the, the problem the existential problem Piketty is always trying to figure out in his novels and explore um, the reverse of that are these questionable moments right of is there some kind of agency or force that is acting on our behalf that is interceding in this cosmic experiment on our behalf and trying to fix the problem no matter how small that intercession might be or imperfect or or how much of a blip it is compared to cosmic entropy this is the question of religion this is the theological question that pkd is always bringing in and he was doing it in his early novels and he does it in his later novels too much more explicitly um but this is sort of the gnostic idea that there are inter intermediaries or or um uh, cosmic agencies as it were that are trying to wrest creation from the demergic um mal maleficent or or just ignorant um gnostic gods right so like they're trying to overcome those and actually help us out and rescue us from this. So in many cases, this is very a very Gnostic tale. And a lot of uh, religious scholars have commented on how Gnostic PKD's books tend to be. Um, so there's this idea, right, that there's a creator god that tries to emanate the universe, and then something goes wrong, something falls apart. Uh, perhaps one of the emanations themselves becomes a demurge and, and tries to create the universe in their own image, and it gets messed up because of that um so there there's this kind of desire from a divine force the original creator of the cosmos um who knows what you know he doesn't always play with theological questions sometimes they're very science fictiony um so there's always this force that's trying to break in to the world and help people and ubik it's ubik and you'll see what that means um in in um do android's dream again it's it's this vision of mercer it's this question of well maybe it isn't just a fake religion maybe there's a reality to this maybe maybe there is a f uh, forces acting against cosmic entropy in the long run that's actually going to gain some ground um so so that's a very 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 big uh, uh, um, aspiration throughout all of PKD's novels, this concept of cosmic empathy. There's, there is a kind of an empathetic force in the cosmos that feels with our plight, feels the protagonist's plight, and, and wants to help them get them out of the fake universe, reverse entropy, and so on. It doesn't always work out. It's, it's usually very impractical. It's usually a kind of an anomaly from the status quo, which is entropy. But there's that there's always the, this little bit of room for not skepticism, but hope. And that's what really makes all of PKD's novels very, um, I wouldn't say optimistic, but uh, there's a kind of a deep faith that, there, that, that doesn't condemn the universe to heat death, that there might be something more going on. There's an aspirational faith, and, uh, and that is through PKD's profound sense of empathy for the suffering of things um so uh you know in his later works and as we here we go moving into some um i guess more theological questions too uh like valis and of course the exegesis and the valis trilogy pkd begins to really kind of explore this head on he's reading in real life historic like biographically he's reading the nag hammadi which were in the 1970s becoming uh, translated and published for the first time. So it was a, there was a sudden realization of a, in popular culture of Gnostic Christianity and this sort of countercultural currents. And so he was reading that. He was reading Greek philosophers uh, um, and the Greek Gnostics and so on. So he was very steeped in this, and he began to work that into his writings much more consciously. Um, but as he says, which is really interesting, Ubik was written like, years before he had 
a very strange experience in 1974. Uh, and yet, Ubik has so many of the themes that become very important for him later in his life and, and, and throughout that decade. So I find that to be interesting, and he writes about that too in the Exegesis. Uh, so I mentioned the Nag Hammadi, and in Vallis, he kind of creates a science fiction form of, well, a, a, a biograph. Vallis is interesting as a narrative in itself, and we could do a video on that. But for the time being, on this theme, on theme number number four, right, on um, cosmic empathy and, and, and cosmogony, um, which is sort of the idea of like, well, how is the universe created? What is the nature of creation? Um, what's the cosmology that we're in, right? Uh, there's this empathetic god or emanation or, or intelligence or consciousness that wants to fix the world, wants to fix entropy. Um, he has an experience, and I have to talk about it for a moment. 1974, he calls it 2374, where uh, he gets a, a, a painkiller delivered to his house after getting some tooth work done, and the lady who delivers it is a uh, Christian, and she has the little Christian fish on, on her uh, wearing a necklace, and there's something about the light and the glimmer of it, and there's a sort of slippage in his experience where he begins to feel as if he's in two different time periods at once. And PKD, if you don't know already, and if it hasn't been clear already, uh, biographically, he was um, uh, somewhat paranoid and prone to he was prone to deep periods of paranoia and um and and to some degree uh, some people say well he was just a little he was just a little off so you know that that's why uh, it comes off in the novels but um we could translate what he experienced here as some kind of altered state as some kind of religious experience and a lot of um religious scholars do do look at this and, and they're very interested in this um so PKD has this experience of being in two time periods at once. He suddenly has this vision that he is um, a Gnostic Christian in ancient Rome, and then he's also PKD in California. And there is something about this overlay of these two time periods, this uh, synchronous um, time periods that overlap each other, which makes him very interested in this concept that, well, maybe time doesn't move in a linear way. So he has this kind of eruption of time in his in his own experience and he writes about it and he novelizes it and he has a lot more happen to him uh valis stands for a vast active living intelligence system and valis for him was this experience of, of of encountering after the fish experience this intense altered state in which he believes he came in contact with some um higher intelligence some some great greater consciousness um he writes about this in in his exegesis he's trying to figure it out he's trying to see if he's just losing his mind or if he has some, some sort of brain problem um some kind of epileptic problem he's not sure what has happened to him but what it could be called what philip k dick um experienced um is a kind of a high strangeness a high weirdness as eric davis calls it um, uh, many, many weeks, perhaps months, of these weird altered states and communications with this thing. Robert Anton Wilson talks about his own experience. He calls it Chapel Perilous, which is sort of this, again, this ambiguity between, is this real or is this fake? Am I just losing my mind? Or is there some kind of insight that's emerging here? He experiences that personally, biographically. Um, through this break, and like many artists who have these kinds of experiences, he translated it into Vallis, into a novel. Um, uh, many artists do this. They, they take what they've experienced and they try to translate it into art to make sense of it, to integrate it, to allow it not to overwhelm them, right? So he begins journaling. He begins writing about this. He writes the Vallis trilogy about it. Um, constantly turning over and over and over what happened to him and he never really kind of comes to a conclusion there um, but it still factors in very profoundly after 1974 so if you're reading pkd novels after 74 keep that in mind the quick paced pulp style of ubik um, or even androids or three stigmata of, of palmer eldritch those um those sort of fast-paced uh, narrative styles slow down quite a bit. And I think in 
post-1974, you get novels that are more mulling over things, trying to reflect on things. They're more dialogue-oriented. Um, they're more grounded in the sense that there's not as much happening to the characters, but they're having these philosophical debates and questions. So a lot of people are not as, um, they have trouble. People who like early PKD may not like later PKD because his um, narrative style changes uh, a bit. But I think if you can appreciate that um, what he was doing before 1974 is this sort of only expanded upon post-1974 in interesting ways, I think you could really appreciate it. Vallis especially. And so, um, like I said, we should do a video on Vallis itself for those of you who are writing papers or just simply interested in, in learning about it. Um, Vallis is narratively speaking really interesting because it's a autobiographical book but it's also a fake it's also a science fiction book so he narrativizes his own real experience into the character um and there's a sort of a meta cognitive uh, dimension to the narrative style that he's self-aware that he's really talking about himself the whole time um so there's a weird narrative play in there it's a, it's another kind of um He's always really good at flipping identity around and flipping it over and changing things and making the reader question who uh, who the character is and then even the reader question themselves. With this, he's doing that with himself, and so there's uh, just a really interesting um, intensification of his narrative writing. So it's a very experimental novel in that sense and very unique, and I think um, if you can appreciate the, those dimensions of it, it might be a little bit easier to read through considering that, considering the kind of meta-awareness that he was writing into the novel itself. Um, so those are really the four main things, right? So I will go over them really quick, and then I'll mention the fifth one. Uh, first one is reality vertigo, the sort of um, undermining of uh, the characters and their worlds and the narrative structure is sort of flipping, flipping things upside down for the reader again and again and again in really clever ways. Um, the ersatz slash fake world slash is... So ersatz, fake versus real, is um, this question of agencies that have constructed a fake world, and then the characters are always trying to figure out who did it, why is it fake, why is the world so fake, and how to get out of it, right? Um, another, number three, is entropy. So this idea of the universe winding down in Ubik, it's the half-life. Um, there's this question of, well, how do we, what do we do with our sort of existential plight, right? That, that you know, we have to face suffering and death and the, the beings and sentient beings suffer. How do we understand that? And out of that comes an empathy, which is three, which is sort of this theological cosmic empathy, this theme of, well, maybe, just maybe, in, the, in, in between the real and the fakeness of things, because he keeps flipping that around, there is something true happening. There is some divine invasion. There is some truth to the religious experience, even if it's faked. And uh, he, he mentions this, right? The, the God in the trash can, the God in, in the kibble, emerging out of the ersatz fakeness of the world, something divine erupts. Um, so he's very interested in that, sort of flipping things over um, and looking at theological questions from the gutter, as it were. Okay, so... And I already mentioned, like, as a caveat to that, his deep interest in philosophy, Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, he was very reading that, and then his own anomalous experience, his, his, his postmodern religious experience, which bordered on science fiction, and he's not sure if he was simply losing his mind and having some kind of, or having some kind of brain problem, or if there was something genuine happening. So his own, his own biography, his own writing throughout his life becomes his own biography, which is interesting. Um... And this comes up later as well. There are other examples where he's writing things and then he's encountering something he wrote in real life, um, allegedly. And it's very interesting. And it, it kind of plays with, again with this idea about um, uh, fake worlds or created worlds or, or, or a, a world in which the imagination and the real are bleeding into each other. And um, there's a paranoia in that, right? So number four is... Uh, no, that's number four. And then number five is, um, I haven't talked about this yet, but I, I just labeled it How to Build a World, a uh, Universe That Doesn't Fall Apart Two Days Later. It's the name of an essay he wrote in 1978. Um, this is a sort of a, it's a minor but a very important p 
point in many of his novels, he always has an interesting kind of uh, uh, commodification or, or fetishization of objects in each one of his novels. Um, in Do Androids Dream, it's the real versus fake animals, which become a kind of a social status symbol. And he really world builds with it. He really kind of builds up these kind of things that people in this world value um, and so on. And, and in Ubik, it's sort of this, um, the half-life experience becomes this thing. And then um, there's a couple of other, other aspects, but half-life is basically you don't really die when you die. You stay um, kind of in this liminal limbo purgatory state where you can still communicate with the living in these sort of ice caskets it's a very spooky image of the underworld um but in that world psychics are real and so there's this whole market and economic and political situation of um of psychics people who can read into each other's minds and get it, and there's no there's no um everything's transparent it's actually kind of a weird mirror image of the internet where no, nobody is sort of secure or, or private anymore, and you need to hire, um, uh, uh, I forget what he describes them in the novel, but essentially they're, they, they, um, they insulate you. They give you um, firewalls from psychics, and you can hire those. So there's this interesting push-pull market that he develops out of all of that. Um, and very, very fascinating. And then in Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, um, one of my favorites of his, uh, really good, really spooky novel. Uh, I definitely recommend it as one of the ones to start with. Um, it's Perky Pat and this interesting drug that people take and they um, um, project themselves into these dolls and they have these experiences of Earth before it was uh, ruined by, I guess, global warming in this world. Um, these characters can kind of zip into the world and, and experience themselves completely as these these sort of Barbie dolls in this sort of 1960s um, uh, mid-century America um, utopias and go to the beach and have picnics and in their mid-century cars and so on. So, and there's a whole economy of this drug which allows them to project themselves into these perky pat sets and they can buy them in the colonies around, around the earth system. So he really, really, really develops the economics and the fetishize. In, in, in sociology, they call it like a fetish. It, it's, it's not a sexual thing it's just um it's it's a commodification of an object in the market right so it's the economics it's, it's what we value um it's not just clothes it's it's anything that we find valuable and, and there's a kind of a market for it in in the world so he's really good at building those up which makes these worlds really convincing and it makes them work it, it makes them not fall apart because there's a there's an economics there's an industry there's this value system and you really kind of get into that with the characters in each one of these examples um so those are the five the the fifth one is is um the sort of economics of these worlds and the objects and the trades and the marketing the marketplace of the world is interesting um and then finally, okay, so what makes PKD so interesting today? I think it's because he was able to be so prescient about the future. He was able to think about things like the marketplace and, and, and through this weird roundabout ways, he was able to kind of see into the future. He was able to sensitize himself in his time to things that were latent in his present, right? So the psychic world uh, in Ubik is so eerily similar to the internet and digital age, um, the post-privacy age, uh, that it is kind of strange reading it and knowing that, you know, that he was still in the age of television writing that. Um, there are many artists who are sensitive to their culture in a way that may have bordered on paranoia, but the artists are deeply creative, and I think they can sort of bring out and make apparent what's going on in a culture um, before other people do, especially very sensitive artists, very kind of visionary, imaginative artists. And PKD was one of these figures, which to me makes him one of the most interesting thinkers, not because he was a postmodern, you know, literary narrative writer, because there's exa there's examples of that, but because he reaches us in the present in a strange way that some writers don't anymore. Um, uh, he, he's only becoming more relevant to the, the existential 
conditions, the phenomenological, right? The, the, how we are being in the world, the conditions of being in the world. And he's got his finger on certain things that were, I think, invisible at the time, but have really kind of become more pronounced as the decades have gone on. And I think that's helped him be, remain more popular and become more popular as the decades keep rolling. Um, you know, there are many writers who have examples like this. Um, just to give one, William Blake. William Blake was a virtual unknown in his time. And yet he's looked back now as this sort of um, visionary on, on many levels, kind of a mystic um, visionary poet and a romantic of the English uh, period as it was moving into a period of industrialization. And he was so sensitive to these things. He mythologized them. He narrativized what was happening to culture. And uh, because of that, and of course, because he's such a profoundly um, beautiful poet, um, that, you know, he the, the future remembered him better than his own contemporaries. And I think PKD is the same sort of thing. We are remembering PKD because he was he, he, he had a sensitivity to what was going on in culture and how it was transforming um, and the existential questions that us in the contemporary world are entertaining more and more because they're becoming more important and less latent in culture. Um, give you one more example to corroborate this. McLuhan, Marshall McLuhan, a media theorist, wrote about this many decades as well, and he's another one of these prescient thinkers. Um, McLuhan often said, uh, he's a media theorist, that the artist is sensitive to the transformations of culture, the, the transformations of media. The artist picks up on that and makes it explicit in their stories and in their storytelling or in their artwork. Always look to the artist as a kind of um, a canary in the coal mine, it, maybe not the most best example, but um, somebody who's seeing ahead, somebody who is, is able to tune in to the latent possibilities, um, the implications of the present. So um, PKD is one of these guys that you should read for all of these reasons. Um, and like I said, he's an infectious writer. You will get into the stories. You will really deeply empathize with the characters. And you will, you will also very much feel a sense of paranoia. Um, so, you know, you have to be in the right mood for it. But as a final note, I recommend going ahead and checking out Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch. Uh, Ubik, maybe start with Ubik. Um, it's a short book, it's a short read, and it contains all the things I'm talking about in a very compact and succinct and fascinating page-turning sort of way. Go ahead and read Ubik, and then read Three Stigmata, uh, Martian Time Slip, uh, Scanner Darkly, um, do Android's Dream, and if you're ready for it, if you're ready to make that jump into the post- 2374 experience, go ahead and read Vallis and start reading the later novels, which are very interesting too. Um, so that's really it, you know. Uh, oh, last note, I'm looking in my notes here. I have a note about the exegesis. If you are really interested in the philosophical questions PKD was wrestling with, or perhaps you want to kind of add that if you're writing an essay about this or something, um, definitely check out the exegesis because he's talking very explicitly about what his novels meant to himself. You know, um, he writes about Ubik in, in Exegesis. He's looking back and he goes, oh my gosh, everything that I experienced in 1974 um, is present in Ubik. And everything that I'm writing about interested in now was sort of contained in a seed form in Ubik. Why, why the hell is that? How did my imagination have a kind of um, a, a precognition of my own later biography? Uh, you know, these are the kind of questions he was wrestling with and exploring, and, and it's just interesting to bring that into context in the way that anybody would be interested in reading the personal letters and journals of uh, any of their favorite writers to kind of contextualize what they meant, what they're going through, and how they understood their own work. So I really recommend that if you want to go deep, but it's not an easy read, and there's no, like his novels, there's no clear sense of what actually happened in terms of coming down to a conclusion there's questions um and perhaps that's what makes pkd so good he leaves reality as an open question rather than a definitive answer and i think because of that there's so much creative ambiguity that we're always able to revisit it and read it in a new light um so yeah and then another thing uh, just as a kind of a closing note if you're an academic 
if you are doing a paper like I mentioned, you might also want to check out Jeffrey Kripal's book, Mutants and Mystics. Uh, go ahead and read that. <laughs> you will love it. It's a great religious studies book about science fiction and the paranormal and the kind of biographical weird experiences of popular culture writers who, who translated their work into culture, um, moved O culture into pop culture, as it were. Fascinating goes into a lot of comic book writers and pkd and so on um recommend that book if you're looking for a biography on pkd uh, a dedicated biography i would check out divine invasions by lawrence sutton and i think it's considered still the definitive biography um if you're looking for a class to take online or a place to plug into you can always plug in with me on my patreon uh, i will always be reading pkd one month or another uh, like I mentioned, I think I mentioned that we did PKD's Ubik in December, uh, and then we did The Lathe of Heaven in uh, in January, and basically we, mo we meet on Zoom meetings every Sunday and talk about the book, and we usually read about one book a month. Right now we're in between books, but that might change. Um, I definitely want to get into more Ursula K. Le Guin this year. If you're looking for an inspired work that perhaps is a little bit less reality vertigo, but still exploring the same th things, I would actually check out Le Guin's The Lathe of Heaven from 1971. Le Guin always appreciated PKD. Uh, she always plugged him in her speeches and talks, especially in the 70s, basically saying, you know, we should put contemporary science fiction amongst, you know, you know, um, uh, the classics, right? So William Blake and, and Moby Dick, right? Um, and then PKD, like we should consider these contemporary classics and science fiction shouldn't be relegated to be a kind of um uh, a pulpy transience that w won't have any effect on culture simply not true and we know that to be true now it's simply not true pkd has had a meteoric rise in uh, popularity and significance for the mo modern world or postmodern world as it were um, but i would re read uh, Le Guin because she wrote the lathe of heaven as an homage to pkd Okay, that's that's it for this. Um, oh, one more thing. Richard Doyle and I, um, well, I put together Richard Doyle's class, PKD, Vallis, and pra Practices of Ultra Metacognition. Um, it's a series of lectures as we read through a couple of these books that I've mentioned, and it's a self-directed course. I gave you the link to that, and uh, it's free online. We did that as a free offering. Um, but yeah, hopefully this was helpful to you and your writing and your reading, and may you enjoy... <laughs> Um, navigating the worlds of PKD. Thanks for listening, guys. And uh, as I mentioned, tune in with me on my Patreon if you want to dive deeper with me. Thanks.